Um, I'm so pleased to say that we're opening with a conversation about uh, the European Accessibility Act. It's such an important piece of legislation. Um, but uh, what we realized was a lot of the conversations you hear about the EAA are sort of centered within Europe. Um, for obvious reasons, um, but that actually is going to have an, a global significance, um, of which um, we're going to explore now, not so much what's inside it, but what's the knock-on effect going to be of having uh, legislation like the EAA um, developing. For those um, that don't know, and we will get a, a brief introduction to it in a moment, um, it's due to kick in in 2025, which is 14 months, I think June, so 17 or 18 months away. New legislation is going to land and it's going to have a significant impact on all sorts of parts of our lives. Um, and one of the questions is what about if you're not in the EU? Um, obviously a question in the UK, but elsewhere around the world as well. That's what we're going to talk about today is find out a little bit more about how um, the EAA fits into the global landscape now, but also the impact it's going to have on the global landscape around accessibility. And hopefully some of the positive things it's going to do in terms of setting benchmarks and opportunities to harmonize standards which will have benefits for people across the world not just in the eu so uh, to set the scene um susanna uh has been working on the ea and many of its predecessors in terms of legislation for some time so no one better really to introduce the uh, legislation and also to just tell us a bit about how you see this connection into the to the global impact so susanna, if, you, if you could introduce yourself and tell us who you were and then Briefly tell us where we're at with the EAA and where we're going next. Well, thank you, Mark. Yeah, so my name is Susanna Loring. I'm here as the uh, representative for the International Association of Accessibility Professionals uh, in the EU. But we say EU plus family and friends, so we are including UK, Norway and, <laughs> <laughs> and Switzerland and, and anyone else who would like to be part of, of the family. Um, so briefly introduce the Accessibility Act. How many days did I have? Um, so it's a legislation, sometimes we hear that you started, the EU started with the legislation on the public sector and now you turn to the private sector. That's kind of right, but not exactly. So the Accessibility Act uh, turns to certain products and services and it doesn't really matter if it's public or private, the company or the economic operators behind it. So it's the product and service that, is in, that are in scope. And if you are a manufacturer and an authorized representative, an importer, distributor, or a service provider to any of those products or services, and you want to sell or, or produce or, or distribute your products and services within the EU, then you are covered. So it will indeed uh, cover loads of, of uh, companies and organizations across the world. And the worst thing that could happen to you if the enforcement procedures uh, enters into force and, and, and make sure and finds that your product or service doesn't meet the requirements, then you could be taken off market. So that is kind of important, I think, to, to, <laughs> to many economic operators around. Um, so the products and services in scope are uh, e-commerce banking, so very um, suitable for, for this event, I think, and, and also e-books and um, the IT systems around the transportation, so not the buses and trains themselves, but the ticketing systems and, and so on and also um, smartphones and computers and so many lo loads of, of the products and services, but banking and e-commerce, of course, being maybe the, the biggest ones um, that we will, I think, talk most, mostly about today. And the, the legislation is a bit different than the previous uh, EU legislation in that it does have requirements within the legislation. So that makes it a little bit hard to, uh, to read because you need to first understand the whole, what is called Annex 1, uh, which defines the re um, requirements for, for accessibility. And then, of course, we, will, we are developing standards, updating existing standards and developing new standards to show the how, how the technical specifications for how to meet the requirements. And that is coming. Unfortunately, the, those are not yet in place, but they will come. And do not wait for them. Uh, you can start already now. You can read the legislation, start with Annex 1, and, and also start with the EN 301549, which is the current uh, standards that we have. And that also um, Canada is, has been um, working with, and, and also in the US, we have been harmonizing. So there is a kind of an embryo of some kind of global uh, standard of accessibility. Cool, thank you. And, uh... Obviously, the technicality that's inside uh, the, the standards, um, that there's, there's, that's something that's happening now. There's lots of consultation going on around that. That's a very transparent and open process. Mm -hmm. You're telling me about that. that sounds really interesting. And I'm sure there'll be people wondering how they can find out what standards are and also maybe influence them. So what sort of processes are underway at the moment around that? 
So um, standards that act as presumed conformance, so minimum requirements, if you will, to EU legisl legislation needs to be European standard, European harmonized standards, so-called EN, European norms. And they are uh, mandated by the European Commission. So the three big standardization organizations, ETSI, SEN and Senelec, have to work together and achieve consensus uh, around the requirements. And I'm chairing that work. So that is one of the most uh, difficult things I've ever done in my <laughs> life. And I, I'm sure the expression herding cats came from this <laughs> specific uh, task of mine. Um, but um, so there's a lot of different stakeholders, um, very varied group and from all sectors uh, and also civil society, of course, and user organizations working together to make sure that these standards um, uh, are there to, to act as presumed Conformance and the EN301549 being the main uh, standard, we got criticism in the last round that we were a little bit closed community, and I agree on that. So now it is much more open, and you can you can blame me for anything, but you can also um, even if you are not involved in the standards, and I of course encourage everyone to become mm -hmm. in, involved in standards. It's super fun, I should, I should. <laughs> uh, but it's it is important. It is it takes a long a lot of time. It's very. Um, sometimes boring, yes, but it is extremely important. And we need all the good people around to contribute to this. So now, this time around, we have a GitHub uh, channel where anyone can uh, provide their, uh, their input. So I hope somebody can put that in the chat uh, somewhere for people online and make sure that we get that information out because we welcome anyone to contribute to the standards development. Cool, thank you. And, and, and just to emphasize, that's across sectors, across organizations, yes. I mean consumer as well as, as producers of services and, and products. Cool, so zooming in on Susanna's life as a kitten herder, <laughs> and then zooming right back out to Jessica, your role at, at Microsoft and the global perspective, how do we join those two dots? Could you tell me a bit about your role and also the way that Microsoft perceives the, the, yeah. the uh, EAA and its, and its you know, future impact on your work? Sure. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Jessica Refuse, and I'm here from Seattle, our headquarters at Microsoft. I work on accessibility, strategic partnerships, and policy. Um, and we have cats to herd, too, <laughs> at Microsoft. Um, I think it's when we think about what our role is as a multinational corporation, and many of you are, are in the same position as we are, um, we have to talk to our colleagues that this will impact and we have to generate energy around it. Um, when we, I mean, people are motivated by different things, but oftentimes when you go to someone who works at Microsoft and you say, we have a standard, they're not super excited. <laughs> I mean, we have gamers and Xbox and they do really exciting stuff, but some people are motivated by that. So we think about how do we generate energy for, for something like the EAA so they understand that this is about people. This is about creating access for people with disabilities to use technology in a way that is truly empowering. The second thing we need to do is create clarity. Um, so harmonizing is really a word we use a lot internally at Microsoft. But how can we show every engineer that works on a product that there are easy things that they can do in order to um, be compliant? It's really important for them to make it quick and snappy so that they can um, understand what it is that their role is. And the third thing that I was thinking about was really delivering those results. At the end of the day, the products that we create truly need to be accessible to people with disabilities. Um, but an engineer wants to delight their customer. That engineer wants the customer, the, the end user, to be thrilled and choose a Microsoft product every time. So by making that matchmaking together, I think bringing people with disabilities to talk to, directly to our product makers, I think that helps us internalize uh, the great work that you're doing externally. Hmm. And, and presumably the, one of the challenges is the standards are different. And that's certainly where we're going to be leading in this conversation, isn't it? It's not just Europe that's building the EAA. You're trying to take account of standards in different uh, territories and across different, in some cases, related but different technologies. And how does that work internally? And what are the challenges going to be? That's certainly difficult internally when you're looking at a lot of different regulations. And this isn't specific to accessibility. We, we are seeing a tidal wave of regulation coming in. And um, it makes it challenging when those regulations are disparate. So um, we applaud the EAA at raising the bar, and we hope that regulation that follows continues to do that. 
But I think it's our job internally to Microsoft to, to take that higher bar and say, this is how we want our products to show up because it truly does benefit our customers. And, and uh, in terms of commercially, you, presumably you wouldn't design something that only works in one territory. That's the starting point, I'm guessing. You would, you would attempt to avoid that anyway. We would attempt to avoid that yeah. where we can, yeah. yeah. Um, I think when you have a large corporation, and many of you are part of those large corporations, um, scale is a word that you hear all the time. How do we scale? Um, by creating things that are one-off, we're certainly not scaling. So take that high bar and see how there are ways that we can raise the bar in all geograph geographies um, is something that we strive to do. Yeah, and I think that's the point about sort of sitting back and thinking, of course it's happening in Europe, but it's going to have this knock-on effect, particularly the scale that you're talking about. I think so. And the, the economy of scale as well, yeah. and getting it right the first time and not having to do it again. Brilliant. Ted, um, can you tell us a bit about, um, I know you're going to be talking about a couple of things. One is your role into it, but also your role in legislation in California. Um, uh, so please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Ted Drake, and I lead accessibility and inclusive design at Intuit. We make accounting software like QuickBooks. Um, <clears throat> there's a, you, he had mentioned a law in California. It's, I can't really get into the details because it's being heavily modified as we speak it's we're there's an industry group that's working with the legislatures and the disability rights advocates to kind of fine-tune this law but these laws don't sit in a vacuum they sit amongst each other and sometimes we don't we have too much um variability between them and i think we need to focus on some of the key aspects some of the key aspects of this law which by the way is about lawsuits so it's like uh you know direct um, liability for companies and um, part of this law is to actually reduce the unnecessary lawsuits um, but at the same point setting some standards um, how do we define what is compliant with WCAG 2.1 because everybody in this room is going to say 100% compliance with WCAG 2.1 is not feasible and if you're focusing it solely on automated testing that's really not a good picture so as an industry, how do we define what is an accessible? Can we say it's got to be 80%, 100%? Something like that needs to be defined. The other thing that's coming up is who is certifying that our websites are accessible? Is it a third party? Can you do it internally? And how do we quantify that the person that's making that certification is qualified? Um, <clears throat> one suggestion, excuse me, <clears throat> is using IAAP, but that wasn't scalable. <clears throat> so you can't just say, you know, these 600 people that have IWAP, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> the advanced uh, certification can quantify the accessibility of every website in California, let alone the rest of the world. So we need to come up with some kind of way of saying, here's a product, it's accessible, it meets this level, and here's how it was quantified and here's how it was certified. I think that's one thing that regardless of where you are, we're gonna to have to figure out as an industry. Um, I haven't seen those answers yet. Now, I will also say that we're not in a vacuum when we add into it, for instance, I really liked AODA in Canada because it set a roadmap for us. And we did things in Canada that we then pulled back into the United States and that also affected our other locations, things like developing an accessibility statement, developing customer success training for every engineer and designer and such, um, setting up the, the protocols and such for defining how are we going to meet the AOD standards as we move year by year. That worked really well because it didn't just stay in Canada. This affected all of our products. <clears throat> so that's why I'm looking at uh, the legislation in Europe and in UK um, I, I think Norway has one. Uh, Canada now has the Accessible Canada Act. United States is working on a bill in the Senate. If this law passes in California, it's essentially going to define all states um, because you can't, you know, live in Arkansas and sell a product in California and say it doesn't apply to me because it will apply to it. So we're basically defining it for the rest of the United States. And, and you talked about connection you're trying to make inside the community just in, in that network in California. 
how, how does it work in, in, in your terms, working with disability organisations? Are they leaning into this? Do they get and understand this? Are they being actively encouraged to participate in it in the way that um, Susanna's talking about the networking within the EU? A sim similar picture. Yeah, disability rights activists, I don't want to say activists, but organisations, they have a goal. And their goal is that everybody in California that has a disability can live a completely independent life. They can do shopping, they can do banking. Um, so, of course, their goal is going to be 100%. But they're also, uh, at least I can say with the group that we've been working with, the groups we've been working with, they're also understanding that, you know, WCAG is a very broad guideline and it doesn't even touch a lot of the disabilities. So there is going to be some flexibility and there has to be some kind of equivalence um, as to how we define something as successful. Um, and I think all of us have the same goal, it's 100%. But uh, those of us in the industry know that we have certain difficulties in achieving that just because of the technology we work with and legacy code and things like that. Cool. So you mentioned Norway. We happen to have somebody from Norway with us. Um, Malin, uh, you're um, in the position of um, trying to use the EAA, in a sense, in, in, in advance uh, as a backdrop to the legislation within Norway. But also, you have a role in terms of enforcement, which is I think a really interesting picture, and, and as Ted says, how are you going to know whether it's accessible or not? It's just one of the many things I'm sure you're trying to figure out. Could you tell us a bit about your role, uh, and also then maybe about how you're seeing the EAA as it comes around the corner, and how you've been connecting and, and, and mirroring and tracking it uh, for the last couple of years? Yeah. Well, I head the authority for uh, what we call universal design of ICT in Norway, which is accessibility in other parts of the world. Um, and our primary job is actually quite a bit what you are describing. Uh, it is actually to interpret what is uh, the minimum requirements and to enforce that. In, in Norway, the regulation applies to both public and private sector already. Uh, so uh, the enforcement part has shown to be a very important tool uh, to bring this area forward, but it's it's not like it's the only tool or the not necessarily the most important tool either, because I think what Jessica was touching on, you know, the motivation is actually key. Uh, the motivation within the industry uh, the motivation in municipalities and government bodies and like across the board to understand what are we aiming for? Why do we have these technical standards that some people find difficult or or don't understand the point of each requirement, it is actually to make the society um, equal and to give room for the possibility for everybody to use their potential and participate. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting before today, it was mentioned also, you know, that it's not lo longer uh, just talking about doing this process or it's an integrated digital uh, services and tech is an integrated part of our daily life. And then it becomes a democratic a question, um, an issue to participate also in the digital arena, so to speak. So e the EAA is very important for us because we've had legislation on private sector for a long time, but to align this now uh, and to align it with Europe and its international play actors in this area is very important for us. So. But if I could just also mention that what Susanna was talking about, about the standardization and the open process, I, I really second that everybody should get involved because I think um, enforcement is often has like a, a bad ring to it for industry often. But I think uh, as a government body and the industry will have one thing in common, I think, and that is to have transparent and predictable regulation that everybody can understand and you know, know whether or not you are within or without the regulation. So I think the process now that Susanna is heading in a very good way is extremely important, both for government bodies, but also for the industry to get a good, as a good uh, technical requirements for the regulation as possible. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, no, and, and, and have, was, you, have you been actively engaging in that through, through the agency? 
Well, uh, we are part of a group called Saga, which is uh, the strategic advisory uh, group on accessibility in Europe, which I've been actually <laughs> heading uh, the last five years. Uh, I'm, I'm now uh, currently uh, moving on, but uh, uh, and it is very important for us because uh, one of the challenges with the, the web directive and the VKAG has been actually to establish common understanding of what does every requirement entails how are you gonna interpret every uh, requirement and we are moving towards a good standard there but that is equally important with the eaa uh, and the the product and services that uh, that will uh, yeah that will fall within the scope so to speak um and i apologize for asking you the same question for five years in a row <laughs> that's okay <laughs> which one's more important the carrot and the stick is what i'm going to ask you about um how do you how do you think people are going to respond to this regulation because you know it is it is complicated and there are different parts to it and depending on where you're operating and which elements uh, of, of your business uh, and who in the organization is listening and all the different kittens you're trying to herd you're at the sharp end trying to get people to actually implement this stuff and i know that you have that balance of the carrot and the stick and i'm assuming that the same will apply yeah. across the whole regulation. Can you just tell us a little bit about how that works for you in, in Norway? Yeah, well, the stick isn't very popular, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> I think actually, or at least for us, our experience is that it is, has been necessary because uh, good intentions and motivation can only bring you so far, I think, and we've seen uh, quite big impacts. I, 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 can, I can mention one example. Last year, we find and Norway's second biggest university. Uh, it's 15,000 euros a day for not having an accessible exam or, uh, and that uh, actually, when it made the whole industry of making uh, educational uh, program and software really aware. We've had a lot of meetings with that industry after that, before that they weren't that interested. Now they're very interested. <laughs> Uh, so I think uh, it's not the stick you want to use because because I think the stick also only gets used that far, you know, if they don't understand why and what is to be gained by this, uh, it's not actually going to be very effective. But I think the the combination, uh, because I think, as Jessica was mentioning, I think every vendor wants to deliver something good, something great and and, you know, something that uh, customers want. Uh, but they will make shortcuts if they can, if it's, you know, if it's not directly profitable or what, whatever. So you have to balance the two. And I think, therefore, you need the both of them uh, to be, yeah. Susan. May I just make a short comment? Yeah. Uh, so I think what we do in the EU and Norway included is a combination of stick mm. and, and mm. carrot, which I think is the really clever thing we do uh, mm. compared to other places, uh, because we don't sue each other, we have a monitoring instead. Mm. That is how, so there is a, an, or, an organization agency, Malin mm. is heading one of them, but an agency at national level that are mon monitoring the websites and, and the organizations in scope, and then they can say, okay, we are going to monitor you, that is not a threat, that is an opportunity. So now you will be monitored by somebody who says, we know how to, to understand and mm. interpret this law, and then there is a discussion <laughs> back and forth. And, and we have done a review of the previous legislation, the Web Accessibility Directive, mm -hmm. and even though during the whole transposition, most of the member states said, ah, oh, this is impossible, we can't do this, and no, we don't have the money. Now they're all positive, mm. because the monitoring actually works. Mm. That was the first round of monitoring in Europe, was the biggest test of accessibility done ever in the whole world, globally. And it has been, I mean, that shows that everything is bad. Okay, but now we have a, a place to start and we can start working. And the, the organizations being monitored, they are actually happy because now they do get a proof of what they need to do and then they can start working on it. If they don't care, then they get a fine, but, but most of them try to do something. Mm. So I think that combination of carrot and stick is really, that is the key mm. that I think will be successful in Europe. Mm. Well, thank you. Stephanie. Mm. Um, how does that look from, from, from your corner of, uh, of the world? And, and could you tell us a bit about your role and, and, and the work that you're doing? And also this combination of carrot and stick and the way the legislation you know, is coming together in Canada. Mm -hmm. So my name is Stephanie Cadu. I am the Chief Accessibility Officer for Canada. Um, my role was created uh, and legislated under the Accessible Canada Act, along with two other, two other sort of groups, uh, the Accessibility Commissioner, 
the, who is the enforcement arm, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Accessibility Standards Canada that's working to develop or adopt standards that may become regulation. My job as the Chief Accessibility Officer is as an independent advisor to the minister responsible for the Act. And the goal of the Act is a barrier-free Canada by 2040. That's kind of a big pot of, <laughs> of <laughs> things. Uh, and my job is to monitor how we're doing towards that goal, provide advice to the minister uh, on areas where maybe things aren't going as well as they should, maybe uh, on something international that might influence what Canada does or should do, um, or where things are going well to amplify and, and encourage others to, to focus in that area. The Act applies to um, federally regulated, the federally regulated uh, public and private sector. In Canada, we have three levels of government with three levels of jurisdiction over a number of areas. So I I'll also spend a lot of time talking about the fact that all of those other levels of government, as well as the private sector, have to come along on this journey with us because nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm really excited to interact with my federal government. They're so accessible. <laughs> but we do wake up and we say, well, we want to go for lunch. We want to go to a hockey game. Very kind of. Um, but if, if those things aren't accessible, we won't have, have gotten there. Um, so the, the EUAA um, is just another example of the same work we're trying to do. Um, and as our work uh, unfolds, the unique part of the Can Accessible Canada Act is that right now it doesn't say very much. But what it does say is that every organization that is encompassed by the Act must proactively engage with people with disabilities to do a self-reflection and to look at all of the things they do in the areas of employment, um, ICT, communications other than ICT, so that would include sign language, plain language, um, program and service delivery, procurement, and transportation, they have to take a look at all of those areas and say, where are the barriers and how are we going to remove them? We're not telling them what they need to do, we're telling them they have to do it. It's a flipping the script on the idea that people with disabilities are the problem and must self overcome the barriers or must advocate for the removal of barriers and putting the onus on the institutions mm. to do it themselves proactively. That's the big shift. Accessibility Standards Canada is setting out what those standards in all of those, that what the minimum level should be that organizations are seeking to achieve in all of those areas. The way I look at it is those standards will become encouragement and if organizations aren't doing a good job, they will become regulation. So at some point, they will be law if necessary. But in Canada, we, we really like to just bring people along with us. <laughs> Although I've been in this world now for 30 years as a person with a disability. I worked in advocacy for about eight years. Uh, and then I went into government and, and was a politician and a cabinet minister for uh, seven of 14 years in government before I was appointed to this role in the bureaucracy at the federal level last year. So I've, I've seen this and I, I, I really, really wanted it to be more carrot, less stick. I really, really want there to be more stick and less carrot now <laughs> because people are not doing it because it's the right thing to do. They're finding too many reasons why well, it's too expensive, too difficult. Um, and it's time to say, no, it's essential. In Canada, 22% of the population has a disability. Mm. That is 22% of taxpayers. Mm. And they deserve equal access to programs, services, mm. uh, and to full engagement of their, of, of their lives. 
um, we want to be employed, we want to pay taxes, sort of. <laughs> and, uh, and, and certainly, um, in all aspects of life, and as we're here talking about that in, in the context of technology, technology is our lives now in many respects and for people with disabilities is even more important mm. some of those things that we all exp all use every day now our cell phones our texting uh captions on our netflix are all things that were developed by the disability community and are now normal and when we were in the pandemic we said all of a sudden overnight government could operate virtually all of a sudden corporations could let their employees work from home those were all things that the disability community had been asking for in, in way of accommodation for years. But only when it mattered to you and you did it become available. But we can act very quickly and we can overcome almost anything if we want to. So my job is largely to ring that bell, um, champion that change for us to go further faster in Canada. Uh, and as it relates to this act, uh, Accessibility Standards Canada and the government are looking at ICT as one of the first regulations that will come into effect, largely uh, encompassing and, and adopting the EU standard. Uh, but they're doing some work, uh, will do some work with the public uh, to look for any gaps uh, that, that our, our community sees uh, and may go further in some areas. But this is how I think that harmonization is, is essential as it is in our country across our levels of government for all of the, the things that people will look at every day. So is the same for uh, technology on a world scale, uh, because we all, I think, need to be able to, to have that seamless experience, no matter where we're going, where we're working, uh, and, and what we're accessing. So on, on the end of that bit, then, in terms of the, the breadth of what you're doing across physical and, dis, and digital, is, is there a difference in how the two are working in speeds? I'm thinking of the EAA being principally looking at accessibility and principally looking at digital. It's not only because it has other elements mm -hmm. to it. Are there, are there different speeds working, different, different um, elements working at different speeds? And... Yeah, we, we can't do everything at once. Um, Organisations have to take a look at those areas, as I say, and put forward their plan those plans that have to be updated every year. And there has to be a feedback me mechanism so that people with disabilities can say, this isn't working, mm -hmm. I've found this barrier. Mm -hmm. And then organizations are expected to report on that feedback and how they're implementing it. Um, that work is underway. And different organizations, banks, telecoms, uh, broadcasters are picking different areas maybe to focus on uh, in their three-year plans. Government, similarly, through uh, Accessibility Standards Canada, is looking at creating those standards at, in, in some kind of logical, step-by-step -step fashion. Um, there are standards already for the built environment that have been updated uh, and, uh, and exist. They're looking at um, accessible travel journeys, because that's a, an issue for us, uh, if you haven't noticed. Um, and and uh, some of the... Um, the other things, accessible outdoor spaces, what is accessible employment? What does that mean? Um, what does, what does, uh, what is a plain language standard? What does that, what does that mean to deliver information in plain language? So they're coming uh, at different, at different stages uh, throughout the years, but the first, the first that will be likely to, to become law will be the ICT. Um, so, uh, Jessica, I'm going to ask you um, uh, about, uh, in Microsoft, th this global picture. Um, do you think people have spotted the standards level? Are they working at the level of Susanna's, you know, are they integrating in there? Is, that, is there other people sitting in those rooms doing that stuff? I'm, I'm wondering whether everybody should be doing that, really looking at what's inside the standard, maybe not realising that it's going to impact on them that way. You're, you're, you're already doing that sort of stuff, I think, and beginning to think about products you're going to be releasing into Europe beyond the horizon of 2025. Yeah, I, awareness is very important. If, if your organizations are not aware yet, help them become aware. Mm. But we are hearing from our customers who are saying, help us, help us to understand what our obligations are. Um, and so we're seeing the increase in awareness. You're probably saying, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I do think that um, there's growing interest and like I mentioned, a tidal wave 
of regulation that's happening right now across the globe. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't hear myself. No, there we go. Okay. Thank you. People helping people. Um, but I wanted to go back to what you mentioned about the carrot and the stick. Um, uh, I love a good carrot. I love carrot cake. I am a, a retired attorney, recovering attorney, former administrative law judge for the federal government in the United States. Um, I think that can only get us so far. And really what, what I think a lot of the tech industry is asking for is the freedom to innovate. Mm. So whatever those motivations might be, and, and we talked about this before, how you truly can build into regulation the ability to innovate mm. beyond compliance. Of course, compliance needs to be that table stakes. We have to get there. Um, but when we hear from customers and, and there is a bit of the fear around compliance, um, it is always helpful for them to understand, like we talked about, number one, this is impacting people. And number two, we can still create and co-create and innovate together. And Susanna, you, you're, you're working with those um, a huge range of businesses. That, that The innovation piece is important as well, I think, for the EU, I mean, in terms of the purpose of the legislation. Uh, how is that, how, that must create a balancing act that you must need to sort of juggle between how far you can push a boundary and how much you can be very clear about a standard? So I think it's important to understand that both the Web Accessibility Directive and the uh, European Accessibility Act are not uh, acts that were, um, the, the main aim is not to support people with disabilities, mm -hmm. it's to support the inner market. Yes. So what we want to do is to compete with the US mm -hmm. <laughs> and Asia maybe, uh, or the UK. But, but so we are trying to level the playing field for innovation and make sure that, that the, now I'm talking as if I am the commission, I'm sorry. <laughs> but but that Europe wants to make sure that, that Europe is uh, uh, winning the game, if you will. And we will do that by, by raising the floor and saying, hey, US has been leading this for a long time. Now, we, hey, we are leading this. And now you, if you want to sell to us or, or do business with us, then you need to comply with this. And I think that is a bold uh, state, um, statement from, from the commission. And it's really, that is a, it's a long-term goal, but it has to do with, with money. And it's only, mm -hmm. and I have the same experience from some of the uh, national governments that I've been working with, that as long as accessibility kind of sits in the social department, something, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Move it to financial and all of a sudden <laughs> it happens. So I'm happy to be in a bank house. Yes. But I mean, that, that's, you need to, to shift that, um, that whole kind of mm. way of, of thinking. And I, um, we heard here that, that people don't jump out of bed to say, I want to communicate with the federal government, but I also don't think that people jump out of bed and say, oh, today I'm not going to break the law. Yeah. I don't think compliance is the driver. Mm. For most people, it needs to be, this is good design. This mm. is, and, and, and really, the Accessibility Act, if you don't have the time or energy to read the whole thing or the whole standard, yeah. don't, then just read the part where it says that the whole idea of this is to maximize the foreseeable use. Mm. So, of course, Microsoft wants to maximize the foreseeable use of their products. And we are introducing also a, a kind of an old term that, that has been kind of surfaced again called multimodality. Mm -hmm. So multimodality is to make sure that if you are providing one format, you need to have another format as well, because surprise people are different. Some people prefer, prefer the design thing, some people prefer audio, some others. I mean, it's kind of an, everyone knows that. And I think the industry knows that as well. And when, and it also, that's kind of a user demand these days that caption, everything should be captioned because people who have no hearing problem, they, they use the captions when they're on the bus or something like that. So the mainstreaming of the whole idea of accessibility, mm -hmm. that is what I think is pushing industry forward. And really, if you think about it as maximizing the foreseeable use and, and provide more than one format or, or mode of, of achieving things, then you are kind of halfway there already. <laughs> and that is much more rewarding to work with than compliance, because that is boring. And that standard is deep. It's a sure way to put family asleep and lose friends is kind of what, how we define standardization work. So, but, but, but please welcome uh, and join us. Um, but I think that that's really the shift. And I, and I, so Jessica said that I think that you are finally waking up, but that's not my impression. My impression is I'm a dinosaur in this. I've, I mean, a couple of years before the Web Accessibility Directive into force, public sector were full asleep. We didn't get any interest from anywhere. They didn't know about this and they didn't care until the legislation entered into force. I'm sorry, all my clients in the public sector, but that was the truth. 
now, a couple of years, I mean, even a couple of years before uh, today, the industry is really moving. And I think that is, I hope, and I think that that is a positive sign. I think the Accessibility Act will, will enter into force and be a much better success than, than everything else we have done before, because the industry is already there, interesting. At least the big players have people working on compliance. They are, they are used to doing uh, assessments. They, have, they use, uh, are used to different laws in different parts of the world, and they have all this. And now I say, oh, no, another thing. OK, accessibility. They have a process for that. And that's why it's also moving forward. And I, I do think that at least the big players see something positive in this uh, legislation and see the potential of making sure that their products and services uh, reach more people. So um, just briefly, do you, would you echo that in terms of your internal view within Intuit? Is this something which is on people's desks? They recognize it. They see it as a, a positive part of what they're going to do in their role. Yeah, I, th I think there's two things. One thing is that at Intuit, <clears throat> we're customer focused. So we've always focused on how is this impacting the customer? And I've always pushed customer over policy and legal because legal and policy gets people to do stuff, but focusing on the customer impact gets people passionate. And once they get passionate about accessibility, then they take it on for the rest of their career. What this means is that we're going to have to double down also on making sure that we have uh, compliance documentation. And that's something that we haven't really staffed up for because we're more focused on customer interviews, um, evaluations, teaching, things like that. There was another thing that was brought up about innovation. <clears throat> Before COVID, um, some of you may remember that there was only one uh, virtual meeting product <clears throat> that worked well with screen readers, that worked well with uh, American Sign Language, that had keyboard shortcuts, that had figured out how to do multi um, audio inputs, and that was Zoom. And our company didn't use Zoom, but our accessibility team did because every time we met with someone, they used a screen reader, we used Zoom. Um, that allowed when we went to COVID that this small company called Zoom got so big because they had done the innovation beforehand. They started with uh, people with uh, disabilities as their core, well, maybe not their core audience, but as a key part of their audience. And that shows that focusing on people with disabilities and making those part of your development can make you innovate at a much higher speed when needed. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I've got a question. Uh, so the questions can come in through the platform. I, I, if I could have a mic, we were going to see if there's any questions in the audience as well, please. Um, question for Susanna. What challenge do you think individual EU country disproportionate burden legislation is or will be a hurdle to the Act's successful implementation? Could you firstly tell me what the question is? And then, and then tell me which bits are relevant. <laughs> so the disproportionate burden, I think there, is, there are similar things in, in all accessibility legislation saying that if you need to do this, but if that means that your whole product will break or it will cost you billions or trillions or whatever, then you don't have to do it. Then there is a workaround or that you can, you can claim that this is disproportionate to our business model or whatever. And, and that means if it's just one person on the whole earth needing this, then probably you know, so there is always a balance kind of built into the legislation and so uh, also in, in the Accessibility Act. Um, I don't know what will happen in 2025 and the enforcement, and I think there are big differences between the different member states. Uh, um, but if you just look at what is happening with the, with the Web Accessibility Directive, the, dis the use of the disproportionate burden hasn't been happening a lot across, across the board. It's, that is not the main problem with, with getting that legislation up and running. It's actually that the user feedback is not happening. So that is one of the, the main uh, things of both regulations are, I mean, we monitor, we have accessibility statements, and we have then the bottom up, so, which is the, the users providing feedback. Mm -hmm. And the users don't know about this feature yet, or they are not encouraged, or they don't find it, or best guess, uh, the feedback um, mechanism is not accessible. <laughs> then it doesn't really work. So, but, 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 uh, so that is one of the biggest problem, and that we, that have, we have a lack of expertise. So IWP is starting to trying to, mm -hmm. to uh, figure out how to make sure that people are professionals are certified, but we need much more boots on the ground, many more uh, experts who know about accessibility. So I, those two things are the, the, the most important issues for the current legislation, and I don't see why that wouldn't be the case also in the upcoming legislation. So this proportionate burden is something that I think the disability community is often annoyed by or they think, oh, that's just a way to get out and this, but we need to have that. Sometimes it is not, it is disproportionate, but let's face it, 
Um, and, and so far we haven't seen a misuse of that, and I hope that will continue. But next, when we meet in 26, maybe I have another view on this, but hopefully not. Marvin. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, double down on Susanna's uh, because we've had that safety valve in our regulation for 10 years. And it's, I think we've had five cases uh, with disproportionate burden and we've had a couple uh, that we've agreed upon and, you know, it was quite um, obvious things. For instance, maps were early on very difficult to make accessible and uh, a municipality in Norway claimed disproportionate burden in making their integrated maps uh, fully uh, VECA compliant, which we of course could have a dialogue because it wasn't technically possible either at that point. So it's, you know, I have, I would just have to agree it's not been misused at all. But I think also it's very important to note that I think we are standing on the threshold, you know, of uh, a shift in digitization as a whole. It's um, infrastructure that we are putting in place as the same as roads and buildings and everything. So the level of uh, requirements and professionality that you have to have to, you know, offer uh, services just has to go higher. Uh, and I think, therefore, as I think it's very commendable with the AA, IAAP, we are uh, we're looking in Norway now at putting this into mainstream education, you know, higher education for developers, designers, leaders, econom economics, law people, you know, everybody should have like this basic level also on what this means, what this is. It's not a particular area for, you know, special experts and interested people of course it is but it has also to be like it just it's just what you do it's the main level of what you have to know to be a service provider so i think that is a very important aspect of this um yeah it's not good intentions anymore it's part of the uh, infrastructure that we're lay lying in place as a society yeah. um so stephanie uh, one one last question around that just linking in when you're looking across that broad scope in Canada, uh, what, what role is education going to play and, and, and the awareness raising and so on? How does government, or anyone, I guess, but government in particular in your role, bring this up to the surface of business? And there's lots of people out there who don't realise this is impacting on them, whether in Canada or Europe or Norway or anywhere else. What, what's the role of government in enabling that to be a higher profile and recognise the, the risks that they're taking as, also, as well as the benefits that they can accrue? I think it is government's responsibility um, to share that information and, and, and promote that. How does one do that? I'll let you know if I figure it out. Um, but, it, but really, it, I, I, like, I like what Malin's saying, and I think, you know, ultimately, we need to get there. We need to ultimately get to a place where it doesn't matter what discipline you're studying. It doesn't matter whether, um, whether you're focused on accessibility. You're just getting an understanding of what does accessibility mean and how do you build that into whatever it is you do? How do you ensure that you're including everyone in whatever your discipline might be? Uh, I would argue medicine is probably one of the places we need to start um, in, in that, but, but, but all across. Um, and so educational institutions will probably need to be told that they need to start putting that into their, into their curriculum. But it's also, it's also the, the broader conversation societally about what our expectations are um, societally. And that's a piece that government can do in just sort of general awareness building. Um, but it's not simple. It's not something you don't, it's not something you can just check a box and it's done. Um, and I think that's with a lot of this work, the challenge. And that's why, like I, I say, the ACTIS code sort of put it out to organizations. You have, they have to figure it out themselves. We want them to do that investigating. We want them to feel comfortable asking the questions, to feel comfortable trying things, even if they get them wrong, because we're going to build this. We, we don't have all the answers, um, and, and things will continue to change and evolve just as quickly as, as technology evolves. Well, thank you. Um, do we have any questions in the audience? And is there a microphone? Michelle, somebody there. Thank you. Michelle. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is around. Say hello, Michelle. Hello, sorry, I'm Michelle. <laughs> um, 
My question is around education. So I'm a STEM ambassador, I'm a chair of school governors, I'm um, CPAC qualified. So in my business, I'm driving accessibility, but I volunteer in an autistic school and I'm trying to work with my school where I'm a chair of governors in helping the, our next generation that are coming up. And while I think we are making amazing strides at what we're doing today in business and how we're moving forward, there's a huge gap for education and how we're doing that. So as far as you know, advice to companies, or uh, it seems to kind of come down to individuals and individual companies to fill that gap. And do you guys see something that we can do or you all can do to drive the next generation and helping them understand that they have possibilities because that's still not understood mm. in some of the schools that I work in and their parents don't understand that either. So thoughts? I can say that Intu was a founding member of Teach Access, which was an organization in the United States between tech companies like Yahoo and Adobe and IBM and Microsoft and uh, into it to create curriculum for universities and provide um, uh, funding for teachers to start incorporating accessibility curriculum into their uh, computer science classes. And so this also included um, field trips and and um, events to help students that were going through computer science that were learning about accessibility also come to tech companies and learn what it's like to be an engineer working for a tech company. I think Teach Access has been a really great project, and but it's very heavy. Uh, um, there's a lot of administration involved in this. So I don't think that they can manage Europe, but I think that there could easily be a Teach Access of Europe that's working with the universities over here. Yes, but I, um, I, th I think I, I take a different, uh, maybe a different angle from your question. There are, in Canada, about 645,000 people right now with disabilities who want to work who are not working. Mm. We need to get them employed. Mm. When they're employed, um, when they're on the stage, others will see there is opportunity. Mm. And that there is represent representation still matters and people with disabilities are still largely not represented. And that needs to change. Mm. Um, it's hard to change the minds of parents who are, who are cocooning their child with a disability because they, they are wanting to protect them because they don't know that their child has opportunity. Um, that is something that, as in my previous previous life, uh, I saw a lot of. When we put people with disabilities into the workforce and it's normalized, then the expectations also shift. And there will only be more uh, expectation to include um, and drive that, drive both the accessibility conversation uh, and further but also just the inclusive society piece. Um, I think I think it's a it's very much a learn by seeing uh, mm. that has to happen. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm I'm going to draw us to a close. Um, that's because the next question is uh, the private sector legislation in UK. What do we see it going in the future? We don't know at the moment, I think, uh, in terms of linking it to the EAA. Um, also, uh, every now and then I wanted to jump in and say, there's going to be a session about that. There's going to be a session about that. There's going to be a session about that. And another one about that. There's two about that. So this is teeing up what we're all going to do over the next couple of days, which is join in with all these conversations about education, awareness raising, professionalization. I think that the, the key bit that we started with, this is, this is something which people may see as something over there, the EAA, something complicated, something with lots of kittens being run around with Susanna chasing them. But um, actually, it, it's got a much broader scope. It fits into a picture that, that's true across the, the planet. Whatever business you're in, whatever the nature of your business is, whether you're in education or in government, this has some impact and is something you need to look up. There's a couple of questions in here saying, where do I find the stuff? We'll share all the links back out through the relevant channels and all the uh, show notes for the, for the, um, for the conference. But 
the first thing we wanted to do was say, this has got something to do with everybody in the room and everybody online, whereas it may look like it's something that's only going to happen to somebody else. It's very clearly coming around the corner. It's very clearly something that all different parts of uh, the ecosystem has taken account of. And then Ted's point in particular, accessibility professionals really need to know this stuff. You need to see this as an opportunity because we're going, to be in the, we're going to be in the position of having to work out whether something is accessible. In the broadest possible terms, that's what we already do. There's more of that coming around the corner. So equally important for us as a profession to be understanding and recognising that. So thank you so much, everybody, for uh, teeing us up so well. We've got a break now until 11 o'clock. Um, I'm pleased to say that the next session is about the media representation of disability mm -hmm. uh, and we'll have a stellar cast uh, talking about that. So be back here at 11 o'clock. You'll find some coffees and croissants outside, I think. Um, and thank you once again to our wonderful panel for giving us a brilliant start. Thank you. Thank you.